1973, criminal John Eric Olson raided a bank in central Stockholm and held hostages for five and a half days. Unusually, the hostages suddenly began to shield the criminal and his partner from the police and subsequently visited him in prison and wrote him letters. This is how the concept of Stockholm Syndrome was born, in which the victim is imbued with sympathy for the aggressor in order to reduce mental stress. One year later, one of the richest girls in America became a fugitive terrorist for the same reason. In this new issue of Histographics, we will tell you how the transformation from the victim into a criminal took place, and whether we can really consider her a criminal. Patricia Hurst was born in 1954 in a very prosperous family. Her grandfather was the founder of the so-called Yellow Press, specializing in scandals and sensations. It was thanks to him that 29 TV channels and magazines, such as Cosmopolitan and Esquire, were born. As a result, he amassed a huge fortune, which provided even for his grandchildren for the rest of their days. Patricia, or Patty, as she was called at home, was the third of five sisters in this family. She could not have cared less about money and dreamed of becoming an actress or journalist. Patty grew up obedient and intelligent, perhaps overly suggestible. However, she was not interested in the popular hippie movement at that time, as well as alcohol and soft drugs, which her friends, the children of billionaires and prominent politicians, often indulged in. Patty first studied in private Catholic schools and then entered the prestigious Menlo College, from where she transferred to Berkeley College a year later. There, she immediately showed remarkable talents at the Faculty of Art History, becoming the best student. Then she began an affair with a young, unremarkable mathematics teacher from the University of California, Stephen Weed. This did not arouse any delights in her parents, who wanted a more profitable party for their daughter, but they did not interfere with their young daughter. Patty and Stephen got engaged, planned to get married in the summer of 1974, until the night of February 4th, forever canceled their plans. The couple's apartment on campus was broken into by two black men and one woman. Threatening with weapons, they grabbed Patty and stuffed her into the trunk of a car. Stephen tried to beat them off his beloved, but received several blows and lost consciousness. The girl was taken to an area south of San Francisco and locked in a closet in pitch darkness. In the early days, she was not even allowed to go to the toilet. Patricia's parents were waiting for demands from the criminals, but in the end, they themselves turned to the media. All of America froze, watching the development of the situation. One of the strangest organizations, the Symbionese Liberation Army, claimed responsibility for the kidnapping. At this time, the black radicals were separated from the Black Panther Party. Officially, the Symbionists also fought for the rights of black people, but in fact, they were terrorists who wanted to take everything from the rich and give it to the poor. By the way, out of two dozen members of this organization, only two were black. One of the two was the ringleader, Donald DeFries, who took on a pseudonym after the leader of the 1839 slave ship uprising. He kidnapped Patty in the company of his feminist friend, Patricia Soltysik. Soltysik was the informal leader of the Symbionists and came from the middle class. It is interesting that the basis of this organization was made of women from wealthy families who decided to fight against money for universal equality and brotherhood. Their symbol was the seven-headed hydra, which appeared on leaflets and manifestos. It was to such people who had a rather vague idea of it all. First, DeFries demanded the release of two members of the Symbionist Army. They were arrested for the murder of a black school principal who wanted the police to help maintain order in schools. He was shot with cyanide bullets, leaving no chance of survival. However, the authorities were in no hurry to release the criminals, and DeFries put forward a new demand. He wanted Patricia's father to buy all the poor in California a $70 food bag and pay for propaganda literature. Altogether, it would have cost him a huge amount, $400 million. The family did not have that kind of money, but Randolph Hearst made a compromise. He promised to supply $6 million in provisions and had already purchased $4 million worth of goods. However, they did not reach those in need. The products were intercepted by bandits who ran in poor areas and began to resell at exorbitant prices. As a result, everything turned into riots, which the police had to deal with. 
When Randolph Hearst asked to speak with his daughter, the criminals disappeared for a week. The family feared Patty might no longer be alive. In the end, the relatives were still able to hear Patricia, though only on a record. She begged for help and was clearly scared to death. During the second call, the girl's voice sounded much harder, and on the ninth day, she went over to the side of the kidnappers and joined the Simeonist Liberation Army. Patty claimed she was fine and protected her captors. Another blow was a photograph of her with a submachine gun. In the background, a seven-headed hydra, sent to her family and then sent flying around the world. Patty took the pseudonym, Tanya Gorilla, after her associate, Che Guevara, and called her parents and former friends, Rich Pigs. Now she began her messages with the words, I am Tanya, and declared that she would fight for the freedom of all disadvantaged people, just like the Cuban revolutionary. The recruit reproached her father for lying and for buying poor quality food for the poor. Her speech was analyzed by psychics, linguists, and psychiatrists who came to the sad conclusion for the Hearst family that Patty really empathizes with the Sibianists and their cause. Trying to explain such a sharp turn in the character and worldview of a peaceful, intelligent girl, experts suggested that Patty fell in love with one of the members of the movement, especially since now she called her ex-fiance an idiot that she didn't care about. The next surprise awaited everyone two months after the abduction of Patricia. Four women and a man raided a bank in San Francisco, which lasted only a few minutes. They took about $11,000, beat the guard, and injured two more people. One of the criminals was Patty. Moreover, she clearly enjoyed instilling fear, keeping people at gunpoint. However, in the arrest warrant that was issued in her name, she was listed as a witness to the crime, not an accomplice. Patricia, in turn, sent a message to the police, where she stated that they needed money for the revolution, so they had to take it from the greedy people. She also angrily denied suggestions that she was somehow brainwashed. Soon, there was a second raid, this time on a sporting goods store. The manager and guards grabbed two of the attackers, but Patty rescued her comrades by opening fire. In the public eye, Patricia's status began to change from a victim to a voluntary accomplice and criminal. While some tried to explain her strange behavior as Stockholm Syndrome, others hinted that her abduction was staged and organized by her. In any case, pretty soon it was possible to establish where the Symbionists were hiding. They were surrounded by about 500 police officers, and a shootout ensued, in which most of the gang died. DeFreeze and Sultisik were gassed by smoke bombs and shot themselves to avoid the electric chair. Everyone feared that Patty would also be among the victims. However, she was on the run with the Harris couple, whom she had previously helped in the robbery of a sports store. The girl sent a message in which she stated that she had died with her comrades in a fire on 54th Street, but, like a phoenix, was reborn from the ashes. This audio actually confirmed the version that Patty had a lover in the gang who died among the others. That day was a turning point for the Symbionists. They lost their center, and luck turned away from them. Nevertheless, Patricia and the Harris couple robbed banks twice more. Trinity was found and arrested in September 1975. At the same time, with Patty, who was a new personality for a year and a half, there was an equally rapid and inexplicable metamorphosis. Yesterday's partisan and revolutionary turned into a trembling, sobbing victim before our very eyes. She was charged with everything from extortion to attempted murder, but her parents sided with their daughter and went to great lengths to prove her innocence. Psychologists and doctors pointed to a sharp drop in her IQ due to stress and blamed PTSD for everything. But there was a lot of controversy in these statements. The Hearst hired a popular attorney at the time, F. Lee Bailey, for Patty for $200,000. He had made a career for himself by defending people who have committed terrible crimes. Subsequently, in his book, Bailey admits that he was sure of her guilt, but on duty, he was obliged to help them avoid punishment and morality in this matter only interfered. But he did not help the Hearst family. Bailey showed up at the meeting drunk and could not cope with the work. It is still unknown whether the lawyer did this on purpose or was simply irresponsible. In the end, Patricia was sentenced to 35 years in prison, despite her descriptions of bullying and how she was forced to choose between death and joining the Symbionists. None of the participants in the movement could or did not want to confirm the girl's words. The injuries, if any, had already passed, and toxic substances and drugs were not found in her blood. But her family was not going to put up with such a verdict. 
Thanks to the actions of Patty's father, the term was first reduced to seven years, and later she received a pardon from President Bill Clinton. From the initial term, the former partisan Tanya served 22 months in prison. After her release, Patricia returned to her ordinary life as a representative of high society and did nothing more as outstanding or daring. She gave interviews, wrote memoirs, starred in a film as herself, and married her bodyguard, giving birth to two daughters. Who really was Patty Hearst in this story? A dexterous manipulator who got everyone around her finger? Or a vivid example of psychological adaption to stress? Only she knows the answer. Have you encountered unusual behavior of people due to stress that they have experienced? Share your stories in the comments. If you liked the episode, leave a like, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell to be notified when new videos are released.